This is BBC Scotland now. Tuesday's top stories with Laura Miller in Seville and Martin Geisler in Glasgow. This is The Nine. Good evening and welcome to The Nine, live tonight with me, Laura Miller in Seville and Martin Geisler in Glasgow. We'll have all the build-up to one of the biggest matches in Rangers history. Eintracht Frankfurt in the Europa League final and meet the fans who've travelled there hoping to witness glory. And we'll see how this beautiful Spanish city of Seville is coping with an influx of up to 150,000 fans. And away from the big game, we're going to find out why the prospect of NATO membership for an independent Scotland remains a source of disagreement between the power-sharing parties at Holyrood. Nicola Sturgeon says the war in Ukraine has made NATO membership right and essential, but our government partners, the Greens, disagree. We're going to speak to their MSP, Ross Greer. And the truth is out there. Could we finally be close to learning whether life has ever existed on Mars? from Seville we are on the eve of Rangers first European final for 14 years only three times in history has a Scottish side won a major European trophy hopes are high here that Rangers could just beat Eintracht tomorrow tonight we will bring you the latest from the squad and gauge the moods among the tens of thousands of fans arriving from all over Scotland and the world a lucky few have tickets but many many more are just here for the party First tonight, Stephen Gordon's been finding out how this city has been preparing. The footballing takeover of Seville has begun. By tomorrow evening, up to 150,000 supporters are expected to have arrived, with Rangers outnumbering their German opponents two to one. Can you miss us? Going to make history? Can you miss it? You know, if you're living in the southern tip of Africa, and you're a Glasgow Rangers fan, you have to come to this, don't you? The authorities here in Seville say that handling two teams with such big travelling supports is the most complicated event they've staged in years. Their expectation that from today until Thursday, the city will be full of football fans. Police say sheer numbers combined with high temperatures and alcohol creates the potential for problems. I'm not worried at all. I believe our teams will be able to counteract any kind of problem that emerges. But obviously, there could be some. Even if 150,000 fans don't come, if it's half that number or less, we will have substantial issues. This, of course, is why fans are here. This morning, a chance for them to get close to the trophy and work out their plans for tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, Rangers fan zone in it. Fan zone. Up at the meeting zone. Be up early. And, uh, in the stadium early. Soak up the atmosphere. Cheering the boys on. We did get offered £12.5 last, last night, but I'm not going to pay that. No chance, no for that money. I see, I, I see Rangers every week at Ibrox, you know what I mean? But most I'd probably pay is about £300. I support for international. On the streets this afternoon, it was clear Rangers won't have a monopoly on noise and colour. Every Frankfurt fan is hyped. You've seen them in uh, Barcelona and West Ham, where with like over over 30,000 people in uh, in Camp Nou, it was like amazing. In the middle you have Jack Wallace. On the right you have my dad. And for this Seville local, a chance to revisit an old family connection. The season his dad spent as translator to former Rangers boss Jock Wallace when he managed Sevilla. To see Glasgow Rangers uh, and. My past with Jock, his family, just to see them have the opportunity to win in, in my city, in his city, uh, the Europa League final. That would be sort of like a full circle sensation for me. In a letter to Rangers fans today, another club legend, John Gregg, urged them to protect each other and the club's reputation as the clock ticks towards one of the biggest nights of their lives.
Stephen Gordon, BBC News, Seville. Well, surely one of the most beautiful things about this city is this cathedral behind me, uh, resplendent tonight and one of the biggest cathedrals in the world too. Joining me too on this beautiful rooftop terrace is our sports news correspondent, Chris McLaughlin. Um, Chris, it certainly look, it feels a little bit uh, more comfortable this evening um, to talk to you here. Um, we've been out and about talking to fans today. Um, it's definitely been getting busier and busier over the course of the day and um, I think in fact you'll probably at some point be able to hear them, uh, mm. their voices reverberating uh, around those streets below us. Um, but there will be more arriving and you know we've still got more arriving tonight and tomorrow don't we? You're right, it's kind of been ramping up slowly but surely throughout the day hasn't it? And, and you can hear the fans uh, singing in the, in the many squares here in Seville in the streets below us and it, you're right it's just getting busier and busier and, and many thousands more will arrive tomorrow into airports like Faro and Malaga and then they'll make their way here. 150,000 football fans this city is expecting. A city remember the size of Glasgow, huge as you say. The authorities seem pretty relaxed about it. They've put on extra transport. They've put on things like extra uh, public toilets in the centre. They say that everyone is welcome to come and, and have a party. And that certainly is the vibe at the moment. Obviously, concerns around security, given the amount of people who will be here. But, yeah, 150,000 fans in a city this size is going to be huge. And it, it does have that big event feel about it. There's something in the air, isn't there? Absolutely, certainly. Um, so that's part of the story, uh, the fans and the security operation. But another big part of the story is what happens tomorrow night on the pitch. And the Rangers team are here already. How are preparations going? Yeah, you're right. And I think something else that we notice uh, here ahead of this final is the confidence of the fans and you're right that the, the players arrived here last night they're staying just outside of the city itself they had the chance uh, to train at the at the stadium and we will hear more in the program from the rangers camp later and from the uh, frankfurt camp but yeah there's they, they come here with confidence they say they're here to win of course they would say that and i think the fans here genuinely feel that there's a very, very good chance that Rangers can win this game, given some of the big size they've already knocked out of the competition. And there's no reason why they can't continue to be confident, as I'm sure Giovanni van Bronckhurst and his players are. Yeah, and certainly today there was a, an air of confidence with many of the fans I was talking to. Listen, we'll get back to you later in the programme, but for the moment, Chris, thanks very much for, uh, for your time. Um, yeah, so I have been speaking to fans throughout the day, and it's been really interesting just to hear some of the stories of how people got here and what it really means to be, the, be here, because for so many, it is more than just a football match. So I've been speaking to some of them. This is a city with drama in its blood and the fans who've made the pilgrimage here are ready for the last dance, no matter how long the journey, no matter the cost. Planes, trains, automobiles, taxis, the lot. Yeah. I think we're about 14 hours travel, down to London, then across London, Faro, then a the taxi over here last night. Expensive? No, my wife's watching, no, it's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Got a wee surprise, a uh, phone call. Billy got a couple of tickets, so paid through the nose for them. The tickets will be expensive if we get beat, but they'll be cheap if we win. Among the thousands of fans coming here, there are thousands of stories. And what's clear from just speaking to people today is that for many, this is so much more than just a football match. Like mother and son Karen and Stuart Robertson from Fife, their trip is a tribute. I lost my dad and mum lost her husband during Covid. Um, and, and my dad was a, was a massive Rangers massive supporter, Rangers. so Rangers has been a, a big thing in our life. This is a scarf, yeah, yeah. and it's came to all the, the, all the games, group so stages uh, we've went. And I brought through so, all the games, yeah. so yeah, it's, just, brought, it's bringing luck to us. He always said if you ever get the chance to go and see Rangers in the European final, you have to go, so I mean, we weren't missing it, but um, it was just, it's a bit mixed emotions because he should be here, but um, yeah, it's just... Yeah want to do it for him. This is history in the making, part of Rangers football folklore. Win or lose, the tales of Seville 2022 will endure. Well, not everyone's been able to make the journey, but if you think that might spoil the fun of those left behind, 
think again. Our reporter Richard Forbes has been speaking to some fans in Glasgow ahead of the big game. At Ibrox, those who aren't travelling to Spain are making their own plans for tomorrow night. I think we're going over to the Go Glasgow Hotel. We're booked in there for the Buffy and stuff to watch a match from there. So it should be, should be a good night. Hey, I'm going to be watching in the house and get a carry out and that, get all the flags up. <laughs> get in the office already. Tomorrow night, unfortunately, we're just going to watch in our house and home. But, uh, I just felt it was too small to take him over to Seville just now. Loud and to have him. All day. In this city centre sports bar, those who support other teams are wishing their fellow Glaswegians well. I watch it in the house, yeah, because I'm a Celtic fan, right? But obviously, we've won trophies and it's Rangers' turn and they're playing really well, so I expect them to win. I'm going to come in here and watch the game, actually, and uh, I think it'll be a good game. Europa Cup usually all the final is always better than the European Cup. Um, well, I'm a Celtic fan, so I hope they win because it's good for Scottish football. Although the pub's peaceful today, tomorrow will be a different story. It certainly won't be a normal Wednesday because it's once in a lifetime kind of generation thing. We're doubling our staff and uh, with maybe. I did a third on it the management is hoping that the heightened passion doesn't bring any problems. I'm not expecting any hassle, you know. We've, we've always been um, quite well known as a mixed pub, you know, and they, they respect one another and it's, it's never really an issue for us. So, you know, fortunately, we're one of the lucky ones, so hopefully it remains. When the final whistle blows, Back here in Glasgow, they'll either be raising their glasses or drowning their sorrows. Richard Forbes, BBC News. So that is the view of the fans then and the build-up to the match off the pitch. But what about matters on it? Let's speak now to Amy Irons, who's going to have a full sports desk later. Amy, Amy what are you going to have for us? Hi Laura and uh, good evening from the Estadio Ramon Sanchez Pithuan where in just over 24 hours time we will know whether Rangers are about to be crowned Europa League champions. What a thought that is. Join us in the next 50 minutes or so. We'll have much more build-up. We'll bring you up to date with all the latest team news and preview this massive fixture with two former players. Well, it is quite late in the evening here, but certainly a little more temperate than it was before. Um, I will be back with you towards the end of the programme, but I'll hand you back to Martin in the studio now for the rest of the day's news. Thank you very much indeed, Laura. We'll see you before much longer. Uh, now then, it was the one tiny corner of the city of Mariupol that Russian troops couldn't take. But now, hundreds of Ukrainian fighters holed up for more than two months in the Azovstal steel plant have been evacuated. And with that, the vital port city in the south of Ukraine has fallen. It's thought a few soldiers may still remain in the plant, but more than 260 were taken to Russian-controlled territory last night. They are expected to be exchanged for Russian prisoners of war. Mariupol has been at the very heart of Moscow's campaign to create a land corridor along the east and south of Ukraine, which will give Russia full control of more than 80% of the country's Black Sea coastline. The BBC's correspondent Laura Bicker sent this report from Ukraine. It's been a brutal and bloody 83 days, but their battle is over for now. The wounded from Azovstal are carried out of the vast steel plant, filmed by the very force they've been fighting. Russia will be keen to air these images, which they say show surrender. But the Ukrainians say this deal is about survival. We need our heroes alive, said the president. For more than two months, the Russians have bombarded this industrial site. Analysts believe this latest attack used phosphorus bombs. But a small fighting force refused to give up. They may have also helped prevent Russia from pushing further north.
Thanks to the Mariupol defenders, the enemy was prevented from redeploying around 20,000 personnel into other regions and so was unable to rapidly take Zaporizhia. Civilians also used the site's vast network of tunnels as a refuge, aided by the soldiers. But supplies dwindled and this cold and fetid bunker was cut off from the world. The situation became desperate. Finally, after two months, women and children were allowed out into the light. As they arrived at the evacuation centre, I met Katarina, who'd escaped with her two children. The boys, aged 6 and 11, are adapting to being back outside and play much as they did in the dark. Their games involve defeating the Russians. Their father is a fighter and remains at the plant. Under the bombardment, the bombs were so heavy it felt like the bunker walls were moving and the rooms themselves became smaller. Sometimes there was an hour break and we hope maybe that's it, maybe that's the end of it. Katarina's home city of Mariupol has been hollowed out by the Russian assault. This once vibrant port is now a shell littered with death and destruction. From the depths of the steel plant, wounded Ukrainian fighters made a plea for safe passage. Many have already died from sepsis, they claim. The Russians say those injured will be treated, and there are reports of a prisoner swap. But it's not clear what will happen to the hundreds of fighters still at Azovstal. Among them is thought to be Katerina's husband. I really, really, really want to help them, but I just don't know how. I feel really powerless. <laughs> he is a very strong man, strong in spirit. He has been supporting me all my life. The Azovstal fighters may have obeyed an order to save lives, but their resolve in the face of insurmountable odds has made them a symbol of Ukrainian resilience. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Dnipro. We're staying with the subject of Ukraine and the First Minister says joining NATO would be a cornerstone of an independent Scotland security policy. Nicola Sturgeon told a think tank in Washington DC that Russia's invasion of Ukraine had strengthened her views on membership of the Western Military Alliance. It is absolutely right and essential, she said. But her partners in government, the Scottish Greens, fundamentally disagree. So is that a problem? We're going to hear from Ross Greer from the Scottish Greens in just a minute. First, though, this report from our political editor, Glenn Campbell. 11 to 15 round burst. This NATO military exercise in Europe was planned before the war in Ukraine. But Russia's invasion has given it new meaning. It has also persuaded Sweden and Finland to seek membership of the military alliance. In Washington, the First Minister has been discussing the crisis with, among others, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and renewing her commitment to independent Scottish membership of NATO. We are clearer than ever that membership of NATO would not only be vital to Scotland's security, uh, although it would most certainly be that, it would also be the principal way in which an independent Scotland in an interdependent world would contribute to the collective security of our neighbours and allies. Contributing, as the party's defence spokesman makes clear, as a non-nuclear member. But would an independent Scotland ban any nuclear weapons, say a visiting submarine from America? There are rules around uh, the visiting uh, of uh, nuclear facilities, whether they be uh, nuclear weapons themselves or just nuclear powered submarines in peacetime. But I'm not suggesting for a minute that we would turn our backs on what would be expected of us as an alliance member but we very clearly wouldn't become a permanent uh, base for nuclear weapons. There's probably never been a more full-throated expression of support for NATO from the SNP in the 10 years since the party shifted position and decided to back joining the military alliance. Like Sweden and Finland, the SNP would seek non-nuclear membership, 
But unlike those countries, there already are nuclear weapons here in Scotland, and the SNP, in power here at Holyrood, would want them removed if Scotland were to vote for independence. Nicola Sturgeon is speaking about her support for NATO, the nuclear alliance, and at the same time confirming that an independent Scotland wouldn't support the uh, naval base that uh, hosts the nuclear deterrent here in Scotland. So it seems a very hypocritical message from the First Minister. The SNP would want to negotiate the removal of the Trident nuclear weapons system from the Clyde, but their partners in power do not share their enthusiasm for staying under NATO's nuclear umbrella. It's a no to NATO from you. The Scottish Green Party objects to NATO's first strike nuclear policy and we'll continue to advocate that international cooperation between countries should be based on a different approach. That puts him at odds with Nicola Sturgeon, who's seeking to reassure the US she would be a reliable defence partner if Scotland left the UK. The war in Ukraine, she says, has strengthened her commitment to NATO and that seems to be the case for governments across Europe. Glenn Campbell, BBC News. We had a quick reaction there from the leader of the Scottish Greens, Patrick Harvey. Let's explore the issue, though, in more depth, shall we, with the Green MSP, Ross Greer. Good evening, Mr Greer. Thanks very much indeed for being with us this evening. So let me just read you back that, that quote from the First Minister today. It's clearer than ever that membership of NATO is not only vital to Scotland's security, but also the principle we, contrib the principle we contribute to the safety and security of our neighbours and allies. Pretty full-throated approach, as Glenn Campbell said. What do you make of it? It's no surprise to anyone that the Scottish Greens and the SNP have different positions on NATO. Indeed, in our agreement between the two parties that saw us enter government together last year, there is an agree to disagree section and NATO's in there. We're, we're comfortable having different points of view. For the Scottish Greens, we enthusiastically believe in cooperation, especially in areas like security and defence. And we agree with the First Minister that Scotland has a really positive role to play in Europe's collective security arrangements. But we disagree on membership of NATO for two reasons. You heard Patrick Harvey list one of them. That's NATO's first strike nuclear policy. NATO reserves the right to launch the first strike in a nuclear war. That would be world ending. We believe that's simply evil. No one has the right to do that and therefore it would be morally wrong for Scotland to join such an alliance. Yeah, but that, that's, I mean, any, any NATO member would tell you it's a deterrent tactic that, isn't it? But it is a NATO policy. First strike is not about responding to attack. First strike is about reserving the right to launch, to actually start that war, to start the last world war, because it would be the war that ended the world but, but as we know it. it. That's the a, nature of nuclear weapons. It's a mutually assured weapons. destruction pact. It's a deterrent. The idea of nuclear weapons is if, you ha if two sides have them, neither will use them. But we fundamentally reject that. The very existence of nuclear weapons risks the chance of nuclear war. If we want to persuade well, well, they, they rogue and hostile, hold on, Martin, if we want to persuade rogue and hostile states to reduce their nuclear stockpiles, asking them to do it, demanding that they do it unilaterally, has no chance of success. We should be trying to do it through reducing our own stockpiles at the same time. Okay. But this is a fundamental moral question. I don't want the last thing that my country potentially does in its existence to be wipe another country off the map. Okay, nuclear but, weapons but, are simply but, evil. OK, but unfortunately, circumstances change and events dictate uh, attitudes, don't they? Because Sweden and Finland had very similar attitudes to you. The Finnish population has consistently hovered around 20 per cent in its uh, approval ratings of joining NATO. Then Russia invades Ukraine. Uh, the last survey uh, in uh, earlier this month said 76 per cent of Finns now want their country to join NATO. This is uh, becoming a fairly urgent issue for a lot of Europeans and in the only way they consider themselves safe. If I lived in a country like Finland where I had a land border hundreds of kilometres long with Russia, maybe I would have a different position on this. I know oh, my really? What, green... you would, hang on a second. You, you, you would ditch your moral attitude towards first strike nuclear policy and just think of your own kind of backyard and your own back? No, not at all. What I'm saying is I can't claim to know what it must feel like to live in a country where those are the risks, but I know my green colleagues in these countries, for example, are struggling with those moral questions. But if we're talking but about no, hang collective... On a second. Hang on a second, Mr Green. You said if you lived in Finland and you shared a border with Russia, you'd have a different attitude to it. I would have a different attitude to how my country defends itself from Russia. I'm not saying I would take Why? a different attitude to the question I thought this was a matter of principle of... down to nuclear weapons. No, the principle of uh, nuclear weapons stays the same. Nuclear weapons are evil, but for Finland 
Ireland uh, and Sweden. But it's all right to be in the gang of people who are armed with them and have a first strike policy if you're really in danger because the bear's at the door. I'm not saying it's all right. I'm saying it would be wrong for me to pretend that I know exactly what it would feel like to live in a country like that. But Scotland isn't in that place. Scotland is on the western periphery of Europe. We're clearly at no threat of a territorial invasion by Russia. Our security and defence needs are different. But the other major problem with NATO is it's not an alliance in defence of freedom and democracy. If that was the case, Turkey wouldn't be a member of NATO. Turkey is guilty of ethnic cleansing against its own minority Kurdish population and against peoples in neighbouring countries like Syria. We are rightly united in condemning what Russia has done in Ukraine, the horrific crimes they've committed there. But Turkey has committed the same crimes, if not worse, against its own population and they are in NATO as well. If NATO right. was about defence of freedom and democracy, then it would be entirely hypocritical of us to line up with a country like Turkey in defence of those values. Okay, listen, Mr. Gray, I, I wanted to discuss with you at length the, the opposition or the, 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 the distance between you and the SNP on this. Unfortunately, as ever, I was too interested in other things you said and we'd run out of time. Thanks very much indeed for keeping us entertained Thanks, on the nine this evening. Ross Greer there from the Scottish Greens. Right, here are some of the day's other stories. Kate Forbes has said her priority is ensuring ferries are delivered for the West Coast Islands. The Conservative MSP Jamie Green said there was a very real risk they wouldn't both arrive by December next year. But the Cabinet Secretary reiterated that Ferguson Marine knew exactly what she expected. The ferries are five years overdue and more than double their budget at present. Unemployment in Scotland has dropped to a record low. The Office for National Statistics revealed the number of people out of work between January and March was 3.2% down, uh, down 0.9% on the previous quarter. UK wages failed to keep pace, though it's suffering a sharp fall of 1.2%. And a Conservative Member of Parliament has been arrested on suspicion of rape. The Tory whips, who are in charge of party discipline, say the unnamed MP has been asked to stay away from Parliament. The whips office said they won't make any further comment until the conclusion of the police investigation. Now then, we told you last night about the Prime Minister's visit to Belfast. He was trying to restore a functioning assembly there without breaking his own Brexit deal. Today, his government took another step in that direction, announcing plans for a law that would allow them to change parts of the deal agreed with the EU. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says it'll ease trade and won't break any international law, but many people disagree. The Nine's Westminster correspondent Rajdeep Sandhu is with us now. Uh, Rajdeep, what exactly did Liz Truss have to say and what do we read into? to it, do you think? Well, Martin, since the UK left the EU, Northern Ireland has always had a special status. So there have had to be these checks going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. And that has caused issues and upset within the unionist community there who feel that they are being separated from the United Kingdom. Now, they want to see a change to the agreement that was made, the Northern Ireland Protocol. And that is what Liz Truss was setting out, the Foreign Secretary, today when she was talking about trying to fix the agreement that was made. Now, that agreement was signed up to by Boris Johnson, and he said that at the time he signed up to it in good faith and he didn't think that the EU would be so overzealous, were his words, in the way that they applied, that, uh, applied the rules and regulations. But Liz Truss today said that it needed to be fixed. There are concerns, though, that it could break international law because this would be the UK changing parts of an agreement without agreement from the other partner, without agreement from the EU. Now, Liz Truss says that it wouldn't break international law, although we're yet to see the detail of exactly what is in these plans because they haven't actually brought forward any legislation yet to see what is in them, to see whether it would break international law or whether that would be an issue and exactly what parts of the protocol the UK government wants to change. Now, as you can imagine, the EU isn't particularly happy about this and they have talked about using all options at their disposal and that's why there is this chat of a trade war because they could bring in tariffs or checks uh, for goods moving between the UK and EU. But let's have a listen to what Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, had to say to MPs today. The bill will put in place the necessary measures to lessen the burden on east-west trade and to ensure the people of Northern Ireland are able to access the same benefits as the people of Great Britain. Yeah, yeah. The bill will ensure that goods moving and staying within the UK are freed of unnecessary bureaucracy through our new green channel. This respects Northern Ireland's place in the UK 
in its customs territory and protects the UK internal market. And Rajdeep, there was more, more wrangling in Parliament today about this proposed windfall tax as well, wasn't there? The tax that's meant to hit uh, high profit companies like Shell and BP in the North Sea. Yes, there was, Martin. So Labour have been calling for a windfall tax. The Conservatives not so keen on it. Um, but Labour have had this amendment through on the Queen's speech today. Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP supported it. Conservatives voted against it. But there was uh, around 60 Conservative MPs who abstained. So they didn't vote either way. Now, we can't say for sure that they all rebelled against the idea of not having a windfall tax. Some of them would have been away or unavailable, but that is still quite a large chunk of the Conservative Party not turning out to vote in favour with the government. And that might be because we've seen softening of the language from the Chancellor around this. Previously, he had been kind of ruling it out, and now he was saying that all options are on the table. Now, that could cause a problem for the Scottish Conservatives, who are against a windfall tax. They worry about the impact on the industry in the northeast. And as I understand it, a number of Scottish Conservative MPs have been uh, talking to the Chancellor to try and get that point across. All right, Rajdeep, thank you very much indeed for that. Rajdeep Sandhu there in Westminster. You're watching The Nine, a reminder of our top stories tonight. Rangers fans continue their takeover of Seville on the eve of their club's shot at glory in the first European final for 14 years. And hundreds of Ukrainian fighters hold up for more than two months in the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol have been taken to Russia. And still to come before 10, the ambitious attempt to find life on Mars reaches a crucial stage. Now then, let's hand back to uh, Amy, shall we, in Seville for all the night sport. There she is. Hi, Amy. Hi, Martin. Thank you very much. Good evening from Seville, where on the eve of the Europa League final, the message from the Rangers manager, Giovanni van Bronckhorst, is we are here to win. His team trained here at the stadium earlier today, and among them, Kamar Roof, raising hopes that the striker will be fit to lead the line in the game tomorrow night. Here's Alistair Lamont. This is why we're all here, on view in central Seville today, the ultimate prize, the Europa League trophy. Tomorrow, it will be transported here. Rangers' potential theatre of dreams Sevilla's Estadio Ramon Sanchez, P1. Rangers emerged into the searing heat here this afternoon. It might be a few degrees cooler by kickoff, but the temperatures are still unforgiving. Happy just to be back among his teammates was Kamar Roof, who's fit to play after injury. That's a real boost for his manager, who feels the hand of history on his shoulder. You know, I feel very proud to be the manager of this team and uh, even prouder to, to take the boys uh, tomorrow into the, to the final. And uh, a huge opportunity for us to, uh, to get the second uh, major prize in history in Europe for this club. So uh, a final is always nice when, when you win it. And if you lose it, you, you know like it. So uh, we are here to win it. James Tavernier is the competition's top scorer with seven goals. He could also become the first Rangers captain since John Gregg 50 years ago to lift a European trophy. The enormity of the occasion is not lost on him. Yeah, it means the world to us. Um, no, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the, the great team behind us and the boss, um, you know, directing us. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously one step away and we all want to make history and bring that cup back home. So I know all the boys will give 110% tomorrow when asked and... You know, we'll leave everything out on the pitch and hopefully we can make everyone proud. Rangers are rightly confident they can beat this Eintracht Frankfurt side, who finished 11th in the Bundesliga. But by no means will they be taken lightly. This team focused on Europe. They lost the half-final against Chelsea about three years ago, 2019. And this team is Martin Hinteregger, um, Philip Kostic, Kevin Trapp, Sebastian Rode. They want to win this cup. And I think the last weeks in the Bundesliga, they didn't focus anymore on the Bundesliga. They wanted to win the cup. They bet Barcelona, Sevilla, West Ham, and then they knew now there's a once-in-a-lifetime chance. The same is absolutely true 
for Rangers. And, you know, the setting couldn't be more apt. After all, Sevilla are the Europa League kings. And indeed, one of their record six titles came in Glasgow 15 years ago. But now it's time for these players to make their own legends. A place in history awaits. Well, as we've heard throughout the programme, excitement is continuing to just build throughout Seville. And earlier when I was out and about in the city, I caught up with two former Rangers players who reckon this current squad has what it takes to go all the way. Well, two men who have their own memories of European nights with Rangers are former Rangers players Mark Haley and Richard Foster. Guys, I knew I had to get you here somehow. Ice cream. Keep, I was going to keep you sweet. I thought I need to get you here to talk about this game and I've managed to persuade you. Mark, how, what do you remember about playing for Rangers in these big European games? Um, listen, I never got to a final uh, as, as a player, um, but in the European situation anyway, but uh, playing abroad was always special. It's a fantastic <laughs> arena to be playing in. It's a showcase for all the players that have done so well this year. Great to be here, great to be having an ice cream in a sweltering hot inferno of a city. So yeah, just looking forward to it. Doesn't get better than this, does it, Richard? And we've seen just the build-up, the, the lengths that fans have gone to to get to Seville. If you're a player in the Rangers team right now and you, you pick up your phone, you see the pictures, this invasion of fans, what does that do to you the day before a game? It just gives you a huge buzz, a huge confidence buzz. You know, you, you see the fans enjoying themselves, you, you see what it means to them, and like you say, some circuitous routes to get here. Mark and I ourselves have been on a pretty a, a pretty long trip to get here, but um, you, can, you can feel the excitement starting to build. There's also a bit of nervous tension, which is good, and I'm sure the players will feel that as well, but fantastic for the players to, to have got themselves here, um, and hopefully, as Mark says, they enjoy the occasion. Talking of the occasion then, Rangers, they've already seen off two... German teams already. Their performances, Mark, just seem to get better and better as they progressed through the rounds. How should they be feeling about going into this game? How will they approach it, given that it, it is a final and there's nothing they can lose at this point? The hard work's been done for me. The, the final situation is an occasion to be to behold, to enjoy, going out there to relax and enjoy and play your best football because if you can do that and relax in front of on this stage then this is this is when the team does perform if we go back 10 years though richard and that's been the feeling i don't know about you but a lot of the fans that we've spoken to over the last day or so it's it's even better for them that rangers have gotten to this position because of where they've been in the last year they've come the last 10 years they've come from the bottom of scottish football and they now could be about to lift a european trophy yeah, I mean, it's quite incredible transformation. And I think that even within those 10 years, yes, they came from the bottom of the Scottish football, but once, they, once they've been back in to the top league and got into Europe again, they've had some pretty poor results. They've come a long way since the, even, even the early days in the competition. But the, the way they've performed this season in Europe has just been spectacular. And hopefully if they enjoy the occasion and they bring their top form, then they've got more than enough to beat Frankfurt. You know, like when you get the feeling here and you're in amongst all the fans, you just, got, you just think, well... Rangers are going to go and win it. We don't know the exact starting 11, of course, at this point, but the big question mark, really, Mark, is around Kumar Roof. As a striker, if, if you're Kumar Roof and you think, I want to play, I feel I'm fit enough, I've recovered from this injury, you want to get back in there, but as the manager, what do you do? Is this the game you take a, you take a chance because you know what he's capable of? If he says, I'm fit, I'm fit, I mean... He's got other guys around him, the sports scientists and all that lot, they'll all give their advice. But for a final like this, does he start? Probably not. Will he be on the bench at 80%? Probably so. Normally, Richard, we do look to strikers for goals, understandably. But James Tavenier is a right back, the top scorer in the Europa League. Do you think, would you bank on him getting on the score sheet again tomorrow? I certainly wouldn't bet against it, that's for sure. <laughs> You're quite right. When if you if you're a striker at the club, you're thinking, why are we relying on the right back? I need to get myself in there and score more goals. But a fantastic asset to the club, and the fact that he's he's the he's the captain, and I think in a lot of games when they've been struggling a wee bit, he's been the one to pick up the reins and really take the game on board. And I think he's he's more than worthy of of the captaincy. And I think this season is. It, I would imagine it'd be the pinnacle of his career and hopefully for him and the rest of the players they can finish it by lifting the trophy. Well, I love a prediction. 
Finally, guys, what are you going to go for? What do you think tomorrow night? I'm going to say Rangers to win 2 1 after extra time. Oh, you're thinking they're going to put everybody through it, Richard, after extra time. Mark, what about you? I'm going to go 3 1 to Rangers. Uh, tough to score and probably player of the tournament. In 90 minutes? Yes. There we have it. Mark Haley, Richard Foster, thank you so much and enjoy the game tomorrow. Confident predictions there from our pundits. What about the thought of our very level-headed sports reporter, Alistair Lamont, who joins us now? Alistair, you were in the press conference today. You got a feeling around the team and the, and the camp at the moment. How would you describe it? Is there a quiet confidence in the air? I think quiet confidence is exactly the phrase I would use, Amy. Um, you know, James Tavernier and Giovanni Van Bronckhurst, who both spoke to the media as well as Ryan Jack today, they're all quite subdued characters. They're not, you know, really effervescent. Even Tavernier as the captain is not who someone you would necessarily think is like a, a real born leader as such, or at least outwardly in these situations. But but their words, you know, you, you listen to their words rather than their kind of demeanour, and they all are they all have a real belief that Rangers can go and win this game uh, tomorrow. And and rightly so, you know, you, Apart from the guys there, there are lots of reasons to be confident. As you say, I naturally have to uh, balance <laughs> out with my, my kind of natural pessimism. But um, but no, within the ranks at, at Rangers, they, they thoroughly believe that they can turn up and win this Europa League tomorrow. Kamar Roof is the name on every Rangers fan's lips at the moment. The question around will he play, should he play? Is it a gamble for Giovanni Van Bronckhorst to start him tomorrow, given he's been out with injury? Yeah, I guess there will be a, a, an element of it being a gamble. We don't know exactly how fit Roof is. Giovanni Van Bronckers said today um, that he is fit and he's available if he chooses to use him. So we don't know yet. Will he use him from the start? Is there a bit of bluffing going on, a bit of a gamesmanship almost with Eintracht Frankfurt? Because we know that when Roof doesn't play, Rangers really have to change their game plan. We've seen Aribo playing up front. We've seen Sakala playing through the middle. That is a, you know, a really different dynamic altogether. So... Giovanni Van Broekers keeping everyone guessing. Um, Kamar Roof, if he if he's available to st if fit enough to start, I think they've got to start him, even if they only get 60 minutes out of him. That could be a really crucial 60 minutes from the striker. Well, we will find out tomorrow, of course, what that starting 11 is going to look like. Alistair Lamont, thank you very much. Well, it might be pretty calm, quite peaceful around the stadium tonight, but in 24 hours' time, there'll be around 20,000 Rangers fans packed into the stadium, hoping to see their team make history. Martin, it's back to you. Thanks very much, Amy. Everybody's super confident over there, aren't they? It's always like that the day before the game. You think you can beat Brazil the day before the game. Tomorrow afternoon, those Rangers fans' nerves will be jangling. Amy, thank you very much indeed. Enjoy it. We'll see you again tomorrow. Right, let's uh, get some more on this, shall we, with uh, the doyen of uh, Scottish football brains, Archie McPherson, I'm delighted to say, is with me in the studio. Archie, right. you'll forgive me for saying you've seen it all. Uh, over yes. the last half century and yes. more. Is there a part of you that wishes Pretty you were... much of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, is there a part of you that wishes you were in Seville just now? Yeah, it does, because um, when I was uh, at that game 50 years ago, it was the most exceptional game I ever had to cover. Um, Rangers' last European. Rangers' last European game, when they won the, Euro the European Cup Winners' Cup. And it was because the game was never shown live. I, I know people think... Oh, no, he can't be talking properly. It was shown live. We saw it. It wasn't. It was a recorded version. We were the only nation that never saw a cup final in, in Europe. Why wasn't it shown live? Uh, because Scotland were playing Wales at Hamden that night in an international. At the same the time S the Rangers were playing in the... At the same time. And, <laughs> that European fight? And the, the SFA uh, had ordained that no other game could be shown in television at that time. So I had to do a commentary knowing that everybody in Scotland would know by the end of the game what had happened. So you could make uh, really a fool of yourself by making a prediction halfway through a game when people would see yeah. it was just nonsense. And then towards the end, as you know, the new camp is a vast canyon of a stadium. For some reason, they put our commentary uh, position right behind the dugouts or the, the, the benches as they were. And with 20 minutes to go or thereabouts, Rangers were still leading 3 nothing. Rangers supporters were celebrating. One sat my knee with a <laughs> bottle of Fundador 
<laughs> in his hand, trying to pour it in a glass for me because they thought it was all over. It wasn't because the Russians came back and scored another couple of goals. Yeah. So these are the things I remember most of all about, well, about that game. I, it changed days very much in, in many regards. So let's compare and contrast. I mean, let, go back a little bit further than that Rangers game. You were in, in Lisbon in 67 when yes. watching the Lisbon Lions of Celtic win the European Cup. Yes. Back famously, that team, every one of them born within 30 miles of Park. Yes. Hey, Rangers tomorrow night, Zambians, Jamaicans, Finns, sure. Colombians, sure. Nigerians. I, I when, when you cross the line, though, with a European trophy on the gantry, is it all the same? Well, I, I remember in 1990, uh, I was in Bucharest Airport when Rangers had just been beaten in the European Cup under Graham Sunnitz. And he came sweeping through the airport past me and he just, he said to me, I always remember it, into me, yeah, how can I win in Europe with only playing 11 jocks? That was a kind of crude way of saying, I'm against these critics who've uh, criticised me for bringing in English, the English captain, the English goalkeeper and so yeah. on. He needed foreigners. And you got Martin O'Neill, no less, playing a non-Scottish full Celtic side eventually. And when Martin O'Neill came back from Seville, this is, it gives you the background of how difficult it is and how this achievement by Rangers is really quite superb. He said, and that was in 2003, to the assembled journalists just before the start of the next season, he said, I don't think, honestly, a Scottish team will ever again win a European trophy. Now, it wasn't so much that he said that. Nobody batted an eyelid. Nobody uh, complained about this because he was speaking a kind of harsh reality, yeah. the logic of it all, that, that Scotland, with the, the minimal finances that they have as compared to Europe, simply couldn't get the right kind of players. And, and Rangers will be delighted that they, have, they are on the cusp of proving Martin O'Neill wrong. I'm not going to put you to, through the, the, the perils of predicting a scoreline, but I'm going to ask you in a word whether or not Rangers can do it tomorrow night. I think they can. Do you? I think they can. But I look back at the achievement where in 2012, on the 29th of July, they beat a team 2-1 in extra time in Glebe Park, Brechin. Yeah where the, there's a hedge. Oh, I've sat on that hedge ten, watching my team play at Brechin. Ten years later, they're in a European final. Oh, it's amazing. Now, that's an amazing achievement. What a story. You think you've seen it all, and you almost have. But let's <laughs> see if there's another chapter to be written tomorrow night. Archie McPherson, always a pleasure to speak Thank to you. you. Thank you for that. Now then, uh, almost done with the football for now, but the excitement isn't confined to Seville, of course. Liverpool are chasing Manchester City for the Premier League title. Now to another football drama of sorts. It is day six of the so-called Wagatha Christie trial. The two footballers' wives and former friends, Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney, are at loggerheads, of course, over stories leaked to the press. Colleen accused Rebecca of doing the leaking, Rebecca suing Colleen for libel. Today, it was the turn of Mr Rooney, the former England football captain Wayne, to give evidence. The BBC's Colin Patterson has been following events in court. Day six, and for the first time, Leicester City footballer Jamie Vardy accompanied his wife, Rebecca Vardy, to court. But it was his former international teammate, Wayne Rooney, who was facing the questions. England's all-time top goal scorer is used to getting into the box. Today, it was the witness box. While giving his evidence, he appeared confident and assured. He spoke about when he was England captain at the 2016 Euros and how their manager, Roy Hodgson, asked him to speak to Jamie Vardy to see if he could get his wife to calm down because she was causing problems and distractions for the team in France. Rebecca Vardy was writing a column for The Sun at the time. Wayne Rooney said he 100% remembered having the conversation and said Jamie Vardy agreed to talk to his wife. However, in a statement released outside court this afternoon, Jamie Vardy said that Wayne Rooney was talking nonsense and must be confused. Today, Colleen Rooney's private Instagram posts were released by the court for the first time. Also revealed were two fake stories Colleen Rooney created to try and deduce who was leaking information about her to the newspapers. She allegedly blocked every account apart from Rebecca Vardy's. Days later, the stories appeared in the sun. Wayne Rooney said he did not know about his wife's online detective work until she posted her accusation. He described the two and a half years since then as traumatic for Colleen Rooney, saying he watched her struggle, becoming a different mother, a different wife. So up until now, it had been the wives giving evidence. 
Today, the husbands came face to face. The Vardys left early, while Wayne Rooney said that he cannot wait for the trial to be over so they can all go on with their lives. Colin Patterson, BBC News, The High Court. All sorts of questions in that case, but here's an even bigger one. Is there life on Mars? It's a question we've been asking ourselves, of course, for centuries, and we could finally be on the precipice of an answer. Today, NASA's Perseverance rover began its ascent up a massive geographical feature in the crater where it landed on Mars last year. The mission scientists think the rocks there have the best chance of containing evidence of life that might once have lived on the red planet. Well, I'm pleased to say I'm joined now by an expert on all of this, Anya Brian from Glasgow University. She studies Mars and uh, her focus is finding out whether the planet was ever capable of sustaining life. Good evening. Hi. Thank you very much indeed for being with us this evening. Right, tell me exactly what this uh, rover is looking for and what the likelihood is of it finding anything. So Perseverance, basically the whole aim of this mission is looking for evidence of life on Mars. So just the small stuff, your average kind of day-to-day -day thing, you know. Huh. Um, and basically what it's done today, where it's got to, is the really exciting part of its mission. So it landed last year, but here it is now at the delta of this crater. So it's an ancient river delta, a dried up region where basically loads of um, water would have been if there was any kind of microbial life we really think it would have been there and it's now going to start ascending through this region where we really think if, if there's going to be life in this area it's going to be there so what kind of life are we talking about? like single cell microbial stuff you're saying that we're not talking cre recognizable creatures yeah we're not talking marvin the martian no we're yeah. talking microbial life hanging around in the sort of sediment yeah very much so um Forgive the question, somebody like you, this is everything, but what difference does it make if we discover there was life there? Oh, I mean, for me, obviously huge, but I think there's a very much an inspirational aspect to this. Um, a big part of our sort of space exploration is very much to just kind of get people excited, particularly young people. You know, when you talk about kids getting them excited about science, nothing gets kids about excited like space and dinosaurs. That's just showing them Mars, but let alone, can you imagine if there's actual aliens? I don't know about you, but most kids I know will <laughs> lose it. Well, let, let's temper our expectations. <laughs> but I mean, what happens if they do find this stuff then? What, do they, what happens? Yeah, so on the expectations front, the rover itself might not find it, but what's amazing about this rover that's gonna do it for the first time is it's actually storing samples that's gonna be brought back to Earth for the first time. So we've never been able to do that before. This rover is finding the most interesting bits of Mars, storing them away, and then a European mission is going to be bringing them back to Earth in probably about 10 years' time. And, uh, I mean, it's been doing all sorts of interesting stuff for the part. You said it's been up there for a year. It's been yes. flying helicopters around the place, exploring all over. This is the kind of culmination of the project, though, is it? This is the key moment. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is very much the start or the beginning of the start of the mission, of the most exciting part of the mission, for sure. We're going to be looking at some really exciting stuff. Um, we'll be looking for what we call biosignatures. So these are the kind of hints that there might be life there. Organic molecules, so every, part, every living thing on this planet is made of carbon. These are sort of complex molecules based on carbon. And we're looking for those kind of things and the rover is primed for that. It's got fancy lasers on board. It's got fancy machines that kind of burn up the molecules. And if it finds these things that might be a good hint of Mars, it'll store them away ready for them to be brought back to Earth. And when might we know success or failure? How long is this next stage of the project going to take? Uh, quite a while. So it'll be basically roaming around for a good few months, probably, of this area, maybe even years. One of the things about missions to Mars is we don't, ex we don't plan for... Um, There's no end deadline. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Curiosity got to Mars in 2012, but it's still going 10 years later, going really strong. We're getting amazing science. So there's nothing to say curiosity, so perseverance might not do the same. Perseverance by name, perseverance perhaps by nature, if, ne if need be. Anya O'Brien, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Perhaps we'll have you in before much longer to discuss <laughs> some findings. Right, time now for a look at the weather back here on this planet. Christopher Blanchett, <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, when we came on air, there was one of those downpours you could hear off the roof here. Yeah. There was monsoon weather in this and part. And we know sometimes this roof leaks as well. So. Yes, well, all good so far, <laughs> but uh, best get on with it, eh? 
Uh, yeah, very <laughs> heavy, but it's already on its way out. It's a school lane, school line. It's moving very fast. You warned us about it last night. Yes. Full marks. Uh, let's take a look at the radar as well. We can see it in more detail. Thanks very much, Martin. Yeah, very good evening to you. It was a bit of a disappointing day for many parts of the country, certainly through central and western Scotland with some heavy rain. And as Martin was suggesting there, we've now seen that rain move its way eastwards. There it is. You can just about make out that school line just in there, pushing its way northwards. Uh, the old rumble of thunder in the mix as well. It will continue to track northwards at a pace over the next few hours up towards the northern hours. For many, it's then largely dry, a few showers, 10 degrees as the overnight low in town. Looking ahead to tomorrow and a rash of showers to start the day across parts of the far northwest, but elsewhere it's a dry morning, a bit of cloud around, some brightness too. Temperatures here at 8 in the morning, 11, 12 Celsius. You can see though we do have a cloudier picture across the highlands and islands and up towards the Northern Isles with a number of showers. Those should ease off through the course of the day. And then for most, Wednesday is predominantly dry, increasingly bright, increasingly sunny, but it will be breezy from the south, a fresh, occasionally strong wind. However, temperatures responding. We're looking at afternoon highs around 18 or 19 degrees, perhaps 20 along the Murray coast. Not necessarily wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. There will be some cloud around, but a decent day nonetheless. And then tomorrow evening, We've got another school line pushing its way and you can see the really bright colours there indicating some torrential rain. Anyway, that's what's happening here. What about the rest of Europe? In particular Spain, obviously. You can see it's dry and sunny across Spain once again tomorrow and temperatures like today in the mid-30s, perhaps still even 30 degrees at kickoff. Back here at home for the end of the week, we still have our rainmaker, that low pressure out in the Atlantic bringing weather fronts and rain our way. That means two very different days to end the week. On Thursday, predominantly dry, some cloud with a few showers in the northwest, but for many, not bad. Temperatures 17, 18, 19 degrees. Friday, though, something cloudier and wetter, with rain moving in from the west during the afternoon. That's the forecast for now. Thanks very much indeed, Christopher. Cloudy, wet, squally, no such problems as we've been hearing in Seville. Let's go back there, shall we, and rejoin Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi, Martin. Yeah, I heard you talking about mon a monsoon there. Mm. It is not that here. It is dry and very, very hot. Anyway, welcome back to our beautiful position here above the streets of Seville. This is a city that is excited and you may just be able to hear that excitement building tonight. Let's get some final thoughts now from our sports news correspondent, Chris McLaughlin, um, who's here again with us. Um, Chris, we heard it from Archie McPherson on the sofa earlier, um, but let's just take a look at that context around this this is massive for rangers massive for scottish football yeah we've spent a long time talking about this fixture but this is really a sporting moment in time and the reason this is so big or partly uh, part of the reason this is so big is because it's so rare only three scottish clubs have won a major european trophy aberdeen celtic and Rangers and also remember where the footballing landscape is at the moment the money involved in football we have countries bankrolling clubs we have oligarchs bankrolling clubs remember where Rangers were 10 years ago it's absolutely huge and to be honest you cannot overstate what this game means to Rangers but also for Scottish football it's simply massive yeah just very briefly um, just speaking to fans today there is there's definitely a sense of confidence I think there is. I think the Rangers fans, given what they've seen so far on this European run, Leipzig, Dortmund have already been dispatched, there is a confidence and you can understand why there's that confidence. They have a team now that they can have confidence in, that they can reach a European final and not just come here for the party, but come here for the win. OK, Chris, thank you very much. OK, well, it does kind of sound like the party here is just beginning tonight. It may be a long night ahead. We'll leave you with some of the scenes in Seville that we gathered throughout the day. Enjoy your evening and we'll see you tomorrow.
Stay with us here on BBC Scotland next tonight. It's Darren McGarvey's Addictions. And later.